Sam, why is SMART such an important tool? The tool that will help people make systems sound better and help people analyze their rooms, understand the issues and challenges. It's fairly straightforward and easy to use. Welcome to another episode of About Pro Sound. I'm your host, Ken Berger. Thanks for joining us. This is our third video with Sam Burko. Sam has the rare ability to understand what sounds good combined with technical knowledge and expertise in mathematics. As an acoustician, Sam has worked on iconic projects ranging from jazz at Lincoln Center to Baltimore's Camden Yards. This episode focuses on Sam's work developing SMART, the worldwide standard for room measurement and system alignment. When I started thinking about building my own tool, my goal was primarily acoustical. And the rest of the world wanted something for production. Yeah, for production. And SIM was a great tool. I, I liked SIM. I didn't like the fact that it was hardware-based. You had to buy a lot of hardware. In the early versions of SIM 2, you couldn't print things. They went through the same development cycle that everyone else does. You work on the primary functions, and then you keep adding on to it. I thought it was very impressive. What I was concerned with was it didn't help me measure room acoustics. And what I really wanted to look at was reflection structures, decay structures. The, the um, impulse spot that no one looks at in SMART. You know, what's interesting is more and more people are looking at the impulse response in SMART. In the early days, people would look at it and did not even understand what it was. That is exactly The production right. people. I don't want to no, talk no, about I acoustics. Mean, yeah, yeah. SMART was... For me, a tool, it went through a series of transformations physically and in my mind. And the first transformation was I was sitting in my apartment on 13th Street in New York City. I had finished the interface. Dave Dahl, our main programmer, and I had written out all the mathematics and all the algorithms that I wanted to implement. And you did none of the actual controls. coding, Dave did the coding. I wrote what's called pseudocode. Right. The mathematical parts of the data streams and flow charts for the way that these things worked and data windows and FFTs. We used a package of FFT routines that were chip specific at one point. It determined what chip you had. And right tried to utilize it as much as possible. The first transformation was, I assumed that I'd need a DSP outside to do anything, and so I made up data. I went into a program called MathCat. Mathematical modeling. They called it a mathematical spreadsheet where you wrote formulas and you could integrate them and make graphs. Right. Still around, yeah. Very yeah. powerful. Great, great program. I just made some sine waves and some changing sine waves so I could watch the screen. You know, I filled big data files and I told Smart, grab the first thousand points from this data file for channel one, the next thousand points for channel two, and I'd hit the space bar and it would put the next data up, display it, and we could look at it. And, and then I realized I could hit the space bar as fast as I wanted. Smart didn't crash. And it didn't run out of, you know, run out of data. Right. And so Dave put a slider for how fast the delay was between frames. And when it got to zero, we realized that, hey, we should just take live data. I said, let's just divide the two numbers. That did the same thing. I said, oh, this is crazy. So I took a pink noise generator, ran it through a Meyer CP10, yeah. the great parametric, parametric EQ. Yeah. That was the first thing I saw in SMART was a flat line. And then yeah. I put Changed filters it. in it and, and it I watched it. Two in the morning on the East Coast, my first call was to Don Pearson. And I said, you're not going to believe this. I'm running a transfer function on my PC. In real time. Pseudo real time. Right. It appeared to be real, real time. time. It was pretty responsive. Don was like, Don. He's like, so freaking what? You paid $50,000 for a SIM system, but now I'm showing you we can do it on in a software. PC in software. And he's like, you don't have phase response. You don't have a delay locator. You don't have this. You don't have that. I wanted to cry, man. I was just like, like, well, that's just typing. I said, just happened. Like, I just figured out that we could possibly do this without a DSP. This is a big moment. And he's like, so what? I got shows to do, man. I, <laughs> Don was not uh, easy sometimes. He wasn't the most geeky guy in the room. No, he was great, man. Yeah, no. I, I loved Don, like, unconditionally. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. I thought he was just the greatest. But he had a level of empirical knowledge built up over time. Oh, it was just... Yeah. To this day, I tell people he had forgotten more audio than I knew. If you think about it, so lucky... I learned room acoustics from Russell Johnson and sound system stuff from Don, you know, Pearson. Don Pearson. Pretty amazing. Yeah. I feel very lucky. I 
try to honor that by helping people and answering questions and walking people through stuff. The era that we, I'm a little bit older than you, but that we were in, this stuff was not like you could find it in a book or there were courses or the libraries. You knew the people that were figuring it out and you learned yeah. from them. There was this great uh, class, Greg Hockman, you know, Greg, yeah, yeah. through a smart class training. There were, I don't know, a good number of people in the room. And Greg's like, how many people in this room have done 100 shows of more than 10,000 people? And half the class raised their hand. And he goes, how many have done 250 shows? And, you know, a couple of hands go down. By the time he got to how many people have done 3,000 shows, 10,000 people or more, and Don's the only one with his hand up. <laughs> and I was just like, wow. There were a couple of things about early smart that were problematic. This dual FFT method and multi-time windowed method was not beloved by people who thought time delay spectrometry was the only way to go. There was a lot of religion. Yeah, in I, this, I, I was going to say they, they loved it with a religious fervor. I got hate mail. I'm going, measure the results. If you like them, if they're accurate, they're accurate. It's supposed to be an engineering thing. And people got really twisted up over discussion about whether or not you could EQ out a reflection. The answer is a very interesting one. It's an academic one. And honestly, it's a stupid one because everyone has an opinion about it, but the mathematics of these things and interpreting that math, and that's what matters. Unfortunately, there are people who do the coding and people who are the users. They can't switch places very often. Moving on, I decided it was time to raise money, go to the next generation. So, yeah. And I wrote a business plan. Did you have a working product? I had something that I thought I could start selling. So I started looking around for what I was going to do with it. My original hope was to get my money back and have a tool that I could use to measure rooms. By this time, Don was experimenting with Grateful Dead sound systems. and Is he using it? He thing? started using it as soon as we got the multi-window transfer function. That was, for me, that was like a personal epiphany moment. Everything falls together from an engineering so point So you say multi -window. The transfer function with the fixed point per octave. Yeah. And I was sitting at my desk and our office was on Union Square. It was like, how are we going to solve this problem? And this realization that the reason Sim and B&K needed so much processing was that they didn't have enough memory. I had unlimited memory, but not as much processing. Thinking about it from that approach, it fell into place pretty quick. Once I saw that you could do this and implement it on a PC in native without a DSP, that's when Don started using it. I would get notes six days a week. Can we do this? Can we do this? How do we show the phase? One of the things that we never got to do is deviation from minimum phase. It turns out that if you have a response, there's a mathematical transform which will give you the minimum phase. You could compare that to your measurement. Right. The concept I think most people don't get. There's no such thing as zero phase. Yeah. And people are saying, well, can you hear phase shift? There's a great little analogy, the all-pass filter. If you take a music signal, you can make an all-pass filter that is very long so that you don't change the frequency content at you all. You just change the phase. But, right, but you're just smearing it out. You're like, you can smear it out for three seconds. You'd be like you're in a bad racquetball court. There's only phase shift there. That's all there is. No change in magnitude or the energy in each It's just smeared out over time. So of course you can hear phase shifts. If you shift polarity between drivers, one driver's doing this and one driver's doing that, you get a big hole. You get an infinite... But do you hear the polarity or do you hear the hole? When that argument has come up, yeah. it's come up up many times that hole is a frequency response or magnitude right. aberration created by that phase anomaly that, right well and it has to be a specific 180 degree phase anomaly you can get some dip at right. 60 degrees right. or right. 90 degrees what's funny people were arguing about these things people who weren't mathematically involved making judgments about how to use mathematical processes that's always dangerous. There's a, a lot of discussion now about A440 versus A442 or A443. A guy came and said, look, I've got a plate and he did the metal filings. He put a loudspeaker and he played A440 and the things just scrambled around. Then came up with a beautiful the mandala-like shape. And it, wow, 443 is magical. No, it's a plate with a resonance of 443. Right. It's magical. Everything in the universe has a resonance. You no, know, you build something that has that resonant frequency. Right. One of the things I love is Tibetan singing bowls. 
Tibetan singing bowls are just resident bowls. People found out that different combinations of metal, how much nickel, how much this, how much that, determine how resident the bowls are. There's a long history of this. Really interesting. I, I love them until they start talking at the end. And then I want to kill them. The guys who figured out the combinations of materials, that's a massive amount of empirical ideas. But that's not the same thing as understanding the physics right. behind why it does that. That's right. I know guys who do not understand gauge staging, don't understand all those concepts, but can mix and do amazing things that is purely empirically learned. My friend and someone I have ungodly respect for, Dave Morgan, great mixer. And I finally said to him, why don't you use smart? And Dave's a great guy. Mm -hmm. Dave said, if I ever need a tool to help me align a system, I'll use it. And I was like, wow. And I went to a show that night. It sounded great. A few months later, he's like, I am working with a system that I'm unfamiliar with and it's out of whack. Can you help me? figure this out, and we were able to do it with SMART very quickly. You don't need to know why gasoline burns to drive a car. Right. But it helps if you understand dynamics and the way that cars move through curves. I used to have a discussion with Mike Adams, right. one of those guys that his hand would stay up when you asked how many shows. Yeah, yeah. And he understand all the technical, and he still wanted to adjust with crossover levels. If you're tuning your system into a room, What's the likelihood of what you want match the crossover frequencies? There may be some instance where it's, it's perfectly aligned, right. but the likelihood of that has got to be relatively low. Before right. there was any of these things, first thing you got to the gig, adjust the balance at the crossover level before you got to EQing or right. doing anything else. That's just decades of right. empirical knowledge. That's great. And it worked. I mean, yeah. the guy could make a system sound great. It's interesting. It's this approach I had to building a tool. What I took away from Sim was that they were telling people this is how to do this. There's a procedure. Right. I was saying, here's a process and apply it as you like. You right. were saying something about you had a product. I had a product. I wrote a business plan. That was really hard. That's um, a good thing to learn. The way I did it, I got a lot of advice. What I did was I boiled down to a number of questions. What does your product do? Who's the potential audience? Who's serving this need now? What's the potential for competition? The, the, the potential addressable audience. That's right. How big is this audience? How do you, you know, reach the audience? How do you reach this audience? I have an uncle, or he's now passed away. Uncle Stewie is a lawyer, and I sent him my business plan. And called me and he said, "Page one, paragraph one. What is DSP?" And I said, "Digital signal processing." How the fuck am I supposed to know that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lawyer. By the time I got to page two, no joke, I was literally crying, literally tears running down my face. I had three months into this business plan. All he cared about was my liability. He had my back. I had to make a decision of whether I was going to pursue acoustics or go on and build the product that Sell you software. and I had talked about, which was a platform for yeah. universal DSP interface. I got a phone call from Wynton Marsalis, who said, I would love you to be one of the design leaders of Jazz at Lincoln Center's new home, but I can't put you forward if you're a part-time software guy and a part-time designer. Chance to work with you, I'll sell the company. And that's literally why I decided to sell. How did the JBL thing? The JBL thing came, we had a product that had some sales. I was about even, looking at what I wanted to build and what it was going to take to build it. I was going to have to go into deep debt. My uncle looked at me and he said, do you want to take on a million dollars worth of debt? I thought you wanted to design concert halls. The problem was, how do you set up a sales network? He stepped in and said, find someone who has one. Who do you work with at JBL? Mark Gander and Michael McDonald and uh, Mark Terry. We cut a deal. I remember the day that the check hit my account. It was a great day and a really nice feeling. All of a sudden, I had worldwide distribution. Right. The beautiful thing about software is once it's written, you can reproduce it inexpensive. Right. In those unit days, cost is very low. Unit cost <laughs> is low. Here, in those days, you had to print manuals. Though. In those days, we had to print manuals, and that wasn't so low. And you had to write the manuals, but now you do it with help file. Actually, let's go forward. One of the reasons that EAW bought right. Smart, I saw it as the basis of Windows for the audio world. And instead of everyone have to write right. everything, like how do you put a graph on the screen, print it, how right. do you save it, all those things, you'd spend all this time developing. We could just break them out and create an API. Right. Windows was very primitive. Certainly 
certainly when it came to audio, even when it came to external communication, you would have this DSP product and this thing. This in many cases had to have a separate computer for each of. Because if you tried to run two different control programs on the same computer, they you would could. be overwriting I, the DLF. I still do that to this day. <laughs> I sat in this room and tuned those loudspeakers. Billy was running on his machine and our soft Windows-based program. Yeah. I was running smart on my Mac. We still run on dual computers all the time. Right. So instead of everyone writing their own ground up communications methods, if everyone wrote it to an API in one environment, mm -hmm. they would all coexist. Uh -huh. QSIS, those kind of products are going in that direction. Yeah, but the thing that upset me, I thought smart would be a module. I approached BSS. Let's make smart a module. We don't have external module support. Look, here's VST. I can plug in all these things into a program on my computer. I show them and they're like, yeah, it's a fad. That's not a well, fad. Every audio hardware product, you make it and you're done and you move on to a new product. Right. Software is an evolving. Evolutionary, right? It's never done. There's a release, right, but, but it's, never, it's done. never done. Software was done to support the sales of hardware. That's correct. There was no business model that paid for that ongoing development in that mentality. Right. We'll conclude our Sam Burko series with a few highlights from the Audio Innovator Award presented to Sam at this year's Pernelli's. If you want to see the entire presentation, there's a link in the description below. Welcome to the Parnelli Awards. I've been uh, very fortunate to have spent most of my life working with people who have the rare ability to understand what sounds good combined with a deep command of the mathematical and technical knowledge that it takes to do that. Sam takes that combination to extraordinary heights. It's been a long, strange trip together since then. I started out trying to get Sam to specify my loudspeakers and then went on to working together as partners in defining smart development after I bought SIA software. Along the way, we became great friends. When I got to know Sam better, we realized we shared a common vision for the future that would enable professionals to produce better sound by correlating what you can measure with what your ears were hearing. With all Sam has accomplished so far, he's unquestionably deserving of this award. Congratulations, you deserve it. Can hang on this for you? In reflecting on my career in audio and acoustics in light of receiving this award, I believe that my work has been effective for three main reasons. Simple luck, an engineering plus approach, and the people who have supported and encouraged my efforts. Simply, my approach is 95% engineering based, enhanced with an artistic sensibility. This means that while I do not, and I meet not believe in magic and engineering, I definitely believe there is magic in the creation, performance, and experiencing of music. So in closing, I want to say that I feel incredibly lucky to have so many great friends and colleagues here and around the world. And now that I'm 60 and I have received this award, I want to make it very clear, I am not done yet. Thank you all so much for inviting me here tonight. Thanks for watching and I hope you've enjoyed our Sam Burko series. Please tap the like and subscribe buttons below and click the bell icon to ensure you don't miss our exciting future videos. For those of you who will never get to see the video, Ken did yeah, not record. Yeah, there is some of that. I mean, we got all of it, some of all of it, and all of some of it. <laughs> okay.